Hello again, everyone. This is Nola Lee Kelsey, and I'm continuing my Pet Sitting for Nomads series. Today, I am going to cover getting and keeping clients. Before we start, if you missed it, I highly recommend you check out the first video. It covers things you need to be aware of as a nomad or vehicle dweller to see if pet sitting is actually even right for you. And again, I am not a professional YouTuber or video editor. I am simply a member of the nomad community who happens to pet sit and gets asked a whole lot of questions on the topic. So I made these videos just for all of us. I hope some of you find them helpful. In video number one, I touched a bit on ways to find gigs. This would include websites, apps, your personal website, word of mouth, etc. My personal pet sit background is, was accumulated via word of mouth, my own website, and using the Rover app. So this is going to be the foundation of the knowledge I share with you today, specifically focused on in-home pet sitting, although keep in mind, if you find that is not an option for you, pet check-ins and dog walks can earn you just as much money. Also, if you did see that first video, I hope that you explored Rover and the WAG website to get a feel for what is being offered and where. I'm going to link them below again. Today, I've also included links below to my PetSit website and Rover profile so that you can just take a look at them. But please, please do not let this discourage you. I do have a freakishly long animal care resume, and it's diverse. And that's just the life that I personally have lived. It is not necessarily for you to have this level of animal care experience. A normal level of dog and cat care experience over the years and a true love of animals is a great starting point. That and being responsible. Other skills, they're just icing on the cake. Instead, when you look at these websites, note things like taglines. What stands out? These are the little five, ten word blurbs underneath uh, your underneath your profile picture usually or at the start of a personal website that make you stand out from the thousands of other pet care providers. Take advantage of this little space. Take a look, see how I did it, and study other caregivers' profiles to see what you think works and what does not. Also read reviews of other pet care providers. What did clients find important? And again, for Rover, consider the type of gigs they offer from in-home pet sitting to dog walking to animal check-ins and so on. And don't forget the where. Act like a client. Put in zip codes of places you may want to be for several weeks to several months and longer. Google the towns and what neighborhoods are the best and Google, then Google what zip codes those neighborhoods have. Put those in. You want to find higher-end homes that are the type to be able to afford to hire a live-in pet nanny while they travel. What are the other caregivers in those areas getting paid for their service? How many good positive reviews do they have? And what are the, what are the newbies charging? Okay, so what happens once you've got a profile or word of mouth has gotten you your first potential client and they reach out to you. When they first reach out, they will almost always ask about your availability for the time they plan on being away. They may tell you a little about their animals and they will want to meet you. I keep my replies to these initial inquiries short. Thank you for reaching out. Yes, I am available uh, for those dates. And then I go on and I suggest a couple of days and times that may be available for a meet and greet. The meet and greet is when you meet <laughs> the client and the pets to see if you're a good match. And apparently many sitters do this very casually. I do not. This is the backbone of repeat business, starting that very first visit. The families you meet frequently tell you stories about bad experiences from pet sitters 
and dog walkers who did not stay or were not there when they were supposed to be. And you also hear of people, usually younger ones, who had people over to their homes when they had been told not to. Even the dogs will bust you on this. I had a client once who said the girl watching the dogs had called and said, you know, Smithy won't come back in the house. I don't know what to do, and it's hot out. Well, Smithy's afraid of men. Do you have a man in my house? And the girl had to admit she did. If all the cameras people have set up in your homes don't out you, the animals will. So just just be honest and act with integrity. Mm-hmm. Everyone has cameras everywhere. It can be uncomfortable, but it is the way it is now. They have them in their backyards, their front yards, their doorbells, basically any place except, except the bathrooms and bedrooms. Now, on to the meet and greet. When I show up at a meet and greet, I start with equal parts attention to the client and their pets. Try to immediately start, begin building relationships with both. Show them you truly care about your animals. You are not there to become the client's pal, and they probably don't want to hear a lot about your life. You're there in the context of a nanny or an au pair, even if it's for a tree frog. So don't nose into their personal business, but do ask questions. Show that you have a strong desire to get the gig and to do it right. To that end, I'm about to look like I am really practicing shameless self-promotion. It sounds crazy, but when you get moving from home to home, meet and greet to meet and greet, and it may have been six and weeks, six weeks since that meet and greet, things can start to blur together. I took notes, but they also became jumbled. I looked online for pet sitting record books, and honestly, my personal opinion is that I just found them to be trite. And as I mentioned in video one, I'm a book designer and self-publisher. So I finally sat down and I made a pet sitting book. This is the book here. It is the Pet Sitting Professionals Organizer and Logbook. It's available on Amazon in paperback and via Ingram in hard copy in paperback. Because this is what happens for some of us who live in our rigs and ride motorcycles when we use paperbacks. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to go ahead and read through some of the uh, most important things that you will need to ask. Go ahead and take notes so you don't have to buy the book, but buy my book. Uh, Of course, there's all the usual calendars and uh, contact information pages that you can record a lot of stuff on and year-at-a-glance calendars for quick reference. But what I'm going to go through now is the client page. And there's one per client. These are the things that you may consider asking during the meet and greet process as an illustration to your customer that you do take your sit and the care of their home and their pets seriously and also so that you just remember this when you get to their home later on. (laughs) Okay, obviously the client's name at the very top is the first meetup time and date. The address, uh, do they have a front gate with a security code? One note on the client's name, Rover only shows you their first name, and you get to a gate guard, an actual human instead of a security code. They don't want to hear, hi, I'm here to see Betty, who has four shitses. They actually want the client's last name. It's strange. Make sure that you, you prompt the client to give you their names when you're setting up the meet and group. Then, of course, there's another section for the pets, uh, their names, a description. Very often, if you get something like Havanese, or you can have a lot of dogs that look very much the same. Next section is for the pet's feeding. I try to keep the animals separately unless they free feed. What does Bam Bam get? What does Pebbles get? What times of day? You know if you've had dogs, that they'll, and cats especially, they'll start milking it and tell you it's time to feed me hours before it actually is. So what time of day are the feedings? How much do they get fed? You want to know, you know, is it kibble? Is it wet food? A combination? Any secret recipes? A lot of- Next section is for pet medications. Obviously, you want to go into great detail here, and I, I, I really hope I don't have to explain why. But get the dose, the med, uh, which pet, and uh, times a day again. You want to know whether or not they want the dogs walked. It sounds strange to some of us who have worked with animals all our lives, but a lot of people don't trust you to walk their dogs, and that's easier on you. Don't get offended. Just smile and nod. 
some dogs are just too old or have other medical conditions or they want to get them walked at like six or seven in the morning because of the heat of the day doesn't go well. They may have a certain route that the dog likes to go to. You can inquire as if there's a park uh, within walking distance that you, they usually take them to where the poop bag's kept uh, to bring on the walk in case they have an accident right next door in front of the neighbor's house just as you're leaving. Uh, the next section is the veterinarian. Who's the vet? Which vet hospital? Address, phone number. Additional care notes, of course. Uh, there's always going to be something. In. Uh, are they allowed to on the furniture? I, when I arrive, I usually sit on the couch and watch TV with the animals for an hour, just kind of get them used to my presence in a calm environment, or sit out by the pool, or you know, have my coffee. If they hop up next to you, you don't want to shush them away unnecessarily, and you don't want to develop a bad habit unnecessarily. So find out, make sure to find out if they're allowed on the furniture. Emergency contact. Is there a family member or neighbor, somebody they can contact, uh, that you can contact if anything comes up? Maybe you get sick, have to run to the hospital, or maybe you have a family emergency. Just, you know, never hurts to have too much information. What room are you sleeping in? I have come through the door, as I said, and looked around and not been able to remember which of the many bedrooms in a home was dedicated to me. Does the... Uh, dog get crated at night? Does the dog get crated when you leave? Oh, uh, get the Wi-Fi and not just the password, but the username. It's great to not burn up all your phone credits or whatever system you have set up for your rig, but you can sit down with that password and pull up 40 or 50 neighbors in a, in a community, and you'll have to test them all one at a time or text the client and ask them. And there are always going to be questions the first day that you have for your client. Text and ask them. It shows that you care about getting things right. But make sure you also have good notes. Don't text and ask them 50 questions. <laughs> uh, TV remotes. I'm, I'm terrible with tech. So I do ask them to show on, especially if there's a husband around. They usually enjoy it. Most people just have one, but some people have three or four remotes. You know, they watch like to watch hockey in Kazakhstan or whatever. So have them do that. I've even had one guy who printed out a love, an engineer printed out a lovely flow chart for me to operate all his remote controls. And that so is the same with the rest of the tech in the house. It can be brutal for somebody who, like me, who's lived overseas for years in a third world country and then came back here to live in their RV to suddenly walk into a house and try to turn on the air, turn off the air conditioning, I should say, or, or adjust the temperature in rooms with a, something like a Google Nest or technology that just won't cooperate with you. Um, same goes for security systems, doorbell cams, uh, so many things. Another good one is when does the trash go out to the curb? Rather you're there for two days over trash day or three weeks. It, the client appreciates it and for the longer stays you will want to take the trash out to the curb. Most people have you take it out the night before. Make a point of being sure to bring it back in promptly after you hear the trucks go by. You don't want to, in some of these homeowners associations, get the client fined for, for getting the can out there too long. And that can be also the situation for parking on the street. It's amazing the number of places that don't want you to park on the street in a gated community after 10 o'clock. Now, what these people do when they have dinner parties, I, I have no idea, but... Um, Make sure that they leave you room to park in the parking space and that your vehicle is not dripping oil all over. Another important thing to ask is about anybody else who will be coming on the property when you are doing your pet sit. Is there a cleaning crew that shows up to do the house on Tuesday mornings? Or a pool boy who might wander in the backyard? And same goes for landscapers. It's also important that you let the client know that they need to inform these people that you will be the one watching the house. In addition, you need to understand what to do with the pets during the time when these people are on the property. Do you put them away an hour before they usually show up? Do the housekeepers know the dogs well and enjoy playing chase them off with them? Every household is different, so you do need to stay informed. Where are the cleaning supplies kept? Pantry, vacuums, and mops. Most people's homes are beautiful when you come through the door, but they are running out the door sometimes on holiday with lots of kids, and they may not notice things like dishes in the sink or toys scattered all over. 
in those cases, sometimes if it's really bad, I will take a photograph of the issue. I'll do my best to clean it. And if there is any question when the client returns, I do have photos to say, look, I'm not the one who drew in the wall with crayons. Uh, do they have a coffee maker? This is important, at least to me. I drink their coffee. They don't mind. No one does. They always are very proud of their Krugs. What you think of their Krugs, that's up to you. If you don't want to use a bunch of little pods, because 90% of these homes are going to have Krugs, either bring in your own coffee pot from your rig or buy one of these little faux Krug pods that are refillable and reusable. You, laundry room. It's important to kind of just peek your head in and know where it is if the dog gets sick or cat gets sick on a blanket that they use all the time. They may want to wash that up for them. And when I'm on a stay, what I do is the very last day in the morning when I get up, I grab the sheets off the bed, the towels, any other linens, and I put them in the laundry and wash them and then remake the bed, fold up the towels, and I let the client know that I've done that. So if they come home exhausted late at night, that's one less thing that they have to deal with before they can collapse. They really do seem to appreciate it. Nobody's ever complained. Plus, if there's extra room in a machine, I'll go ahead and throw my own clothes in or some of them, wash them at the same time, and just get that out of the way so I don't need to go straight from their house to a laundry mat. They often they'll tell you, go ahead and do your laundry here. But under any circumstances, that last day, uh, I'll throw, usually throw a few things in. So, do you want my, me to pick up the mail? And if so, where's the mail key? And where would you like me to leave it? Only about half the time do they want this. But almost every time a client gets a package delivered, or I've had people getting ready for a wedding who are getting nine or ten a day, have a space away from the animals where you put them all immediately when they arrive so you don't need to worry about getting it organized when you leave. And do you want me to water your plants? Uh -huh. It's usually just indoor plants if they do ask you. Some people will leave them right by the sink for you, but other times they will take you around the house and point out which ones are real and which ones are fake. So you know what to water. Mm -hmm. And then after notes. What is it that I learned during my stay? And I can only think of a negative example of that, so I hesitate to use it. But I, I have down here, the client had three cats that weren't declared on the Rover app. That, now, that was my very first gig with Rover. If a client tried to pull that on me today during the meet and greet, I would cut that shit off. If, if they've got eight Halvanese and they're all 16 years old and just sleeping all the time, I'm not going to expect them to pay an eight dog rate. I'll give them a big discount. But when they don't, when they get into the Rover app, you know, they don't claim all their animals, they don't offer to pay. That's kind of a red light for me. So that's all the notes I really have from inside the book that I think you should consider asking during your meet and greet. It really makes you look much more professional. Countless clients have told me how much they appreciate it and how it instilled confidence in them. I will go ahead and just get in touch base on a few final things because really if you have taken good notes, then what's gonna happen is you'll find that the sit goes fairly seamlessly. Text the client's photos of their animals a couple times a day with little notes as all is well, or I just arrived and everything looks great. It just, I, it sounds terrible to say, but I actually call the photos you send to, in my mind only, proof of life photos. It really does put their mind at ease, even if that's not the best term to use for them, uh, at least out loud. But that's what it is. You're giving the client assurance. Don't forget about all the cameras. Don't go running to the pool naked. Don't go up in the middle of the night in your t-shirt and underwear to get milk out of the fridge. Cameras, cameras, cameras. If there is property damage, rip the Band-Aid off fast. Admit it. Send them a photo. Show them a picture of it. Ask their advice so you're engaged in, the, in dealing with the situation. You, plus, you, just don't, you don't want the client to return from the airport and then be hit with a bunch of bad things wrong. Give them time to absorb the situation while they're still away and uh, come back calmer. <laughs> when a client is arriving home, make sure that if you leave beforehand that they know, that you know where they want the key left. If it's going to be shut inside, make sure absolutely everything you have is out of the house and the house is spotless before you go. Then 
to then at the follow up, once you're gone, make sure that you text the client and say, hey, did you make it home okay? Were the dogs happy to see you? It again lets them know that you were professional and concerned and gives you peace of mind because what happens if they something happened to them on the way home? You want to know that those animals are taken care of. On Rover, write a review for your client and their pets. The site will prompt you to do so. The benefit is several fold. The client will then more, be more likely to leave you a review. Your getting and giving reviews moves you up in the algorithm on Rover to show you first to more people. In addition, this prompts them to remember to leave you a tip. I find that either they've left it at the house or they do this about 30% of the time, but every little bit helps. It also gives you a chance to read over what they wrote about you and see places where you may be able to improve. Most important, these reviews are with you wherever you move on to. When you travel to a new town, if you want to sit again, dog walk again, do pet check-ins again, you're not starting from scratch. People see that you are experienced, they see how many star ratings you have, they don't necessarily pay attention to where you got them. So once you've built this foundation of trust with clients, it's there to stay. Your good feedback and social proof is important when starting out as a pet sitter, and you'll get a lot more gigs a lot faster once you invest a few months building this up. Unlike many of the short-term jobs out there that are seasonal, these are non-seasonal opportunities, and you can take the the references, the profiles with you from town to town to get you more work. So keep that in mind. I apologize for going on so long. This information is just really important. I hope you all got something out of it. The next video will just be on working with the animals, something hopefully fun and hopefully very short. If, again, if you have any questions or things I missed, please note them down below. There may be a fourth video when this is all done after a while to touch back on things that I forgot to mention or other questions that you may have. Thank you very much and have a great day, everybody.